So our next presenter today will be Emily Paracci. She is a zoo zoonosis team lead for the Center for Disease Control and Prevention with the CDC. Today, we're gonna, she's gonna be talking about CDC preventative on animal transportation. Put your hands together for Emily. Good morning, everybody. Almost afternoon, I guess. Um, so my name is Emily Paracci, and I am a veterinarian in the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine at the CDC. Um, and I work specifically on zoonosis prevention and animal import regulations. So today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about CDC's background on live animal regulations, our role in animal importation and transportation, and then I thought I'd spend a little bit of time going over some case reports because I think uh, sometimes examples of cases that have um, gone really poorly are a good way for us to learn and to stimulate discussion about changes and improvements we can make. All right, so um, CDC's Division of Global Migration and Quarantine's mission is to protect the public's health at US borders and beyond. So at our borders, uh, we partner with USDA, Fish and Wildlife, Customs and Border Protection um, to make sure that uh, animals and animal products that are imported are safe and are not a public health threat to people. I think this is a cool picture that I'm sure you guys have all seen. Um, the volume of traffic flow through international points of entry creates uh, the potential for rapid widespread dissemination of communicable diseases. Um, this pattern that people travel is the same pattern that our live animals and animal products travel. And as you can see, communicable disease is really only a flight away. Now here in the US, CDC has 20 quarantine stations 18 of those are uh, at, at uh, airports, at I think probably the, some of the busiest airports in the US. And then we also have two land border quarantine stations in El Paso and San Diego. But the name is a little bit of a misnomer. These quarantine stations do not actually quarantine people or animals at these locations. What we do at these locations is we respond to reports of illness in CDC regulated animals um, that arrive on airplanes, ships, or at land border crossings. We will inspect animals and animal products that pose a potential public health threat. We provide travelers with essential uh, pet importation information so that they're able to bring their pets into the US. We also inspect cargo for potential vectors of human disease. And then we work to build partnerships uh, in order to conduct disease surveillance and implement control measures. So our uh, regulations are broadly, broadly based on uh, four main categories, but I'm only gonna focus on our live animal import regulations today. So CDC as an agency is focused on protecting human health but you really can't separate human health from animal health. It's really all one health, right? Diseases that impact animals can spill over into people. And so we do regulate a certain number of live animals um, that have been linked or associated with zoonotic diseases. And those are diseases that can be transmitted from animals to people. So you can see here, CDC regulates the importation of dogs because of the risk of rabies. We also regulate the importation of non-human primates due to diseases such as tuberculosis, um, viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola and Marburg, um, herpes B virus, which Gwen mentioned earlier, and some other diseases. The list continues. Um, I do wanna point out African rodents because I'm gonna talk about them a little bit later. Um, we do regulate them because of the risk of monkeypox or mpox transmission. Back in 2003, there was a shipment of African rodents that came in and was housed with pet prairie dogs that were going to be sold uh, in uh, pet markets. And unfortunately, the prairie dogs contracted monkeypox from the African rodents. Um, and then those pet prairie dogs, when they were purchased, 
by families, um, 43 people were infected with monkeypox from the prairie dogs. Uh, and then here's our last couple animals that we regulate. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our live animal requirements for importing these animals. So we do regulate dogs and cats. Um, our entry requirements for cats are pretty minimal. We require cats to appear healthy on arrival. If they don't appear healthy, we can place them on a CDC hold and have a veterinarian evaluate their health status to make sure that they are not carrying a disease of public health concern that could be transmitted to a person. Our entry requirements for dogs depend on whether the dog is coming from a rabies free country or a rabies endemic country, which we refer to as high risk rabies countries. Now dogs that arrive from a rabies free country, uh, they have to be healthy on arrival, just like a cat, but we don't have any paperwork requirements for them. We recommend rabies vaccination, but we don't require it. Dogs that have been in a high risk rabies country in the past six months have several options that they can follow to be able to be imported into the United States. Um, but all of them have to be at least six months of age. They have to be microchipped. They have to have proof of a rabies vaccine. And then they have to arrive at a port with either a CDC quarantine station, as I showed on the map earlier, or in some cases, they have to arrive at a port with a CDC approved animal care facility. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later. Um, so I did want to just put the announcement out there because we are sharing this information with the, everybody that we talked to. Um, on July 10th of this year, CDC did publish a notice of proposed rulemaking to begin the process of updating our dog and cat regulation. The last time our dog and cat regulation was updated was nearly 70 years ago. And as Chad mentioned in his presentation yesterday, the animal importation and transportation landscape has changed dramatically over these last 70 years. So it's really important that we update our regulations to reflect the current issues that we need to address. This NPRM is open for public comment until September 8th. And if any of you are interested in going and reading the proposed changes, it's available at uh, federalregister.gov. So CDC also regulates the importation of non-human primates. Um, and we really uh, strictly regulate their importation because of the diseases I showed on a previous slide. So non-human primates can only be imported for the purposes of science, education, or exhibition. We strictly prohibit the importation of NHPs as pets. Only CDC registered importers can import non-human primates from outside the United States. All of these registered importers have to get advanced approval from CDC before they can ship a flight or ship, ship NHPs on a flight. And additionally, all of the NHPs that arrive in the US have to go to a CDC registered quarantine facility for a minimum of 31 days, the first 31 days that they're here in the US, where they undergo testing for infectious diseases such as tuberculosis. So our NHP import program really has three parts. The first part consists of review. That's kind of our paperwork part. So we have veterinarians that review um, our quarantine facility registration paperwork. We require very extensive standard operating procedures that cover the NHPs from the moment those wheels on the airplane touch down until the moment that they are released from CDC quarantine 31 days later. So we will review their standard operating procedures. We'll make sure that how they are handling the NHPs is safe, that their staff are trained to wear appropriate PPE, um, that they are reporting any illnesses or death that occur during quarantine. Uh, and we review all of those records. The second component of the program is a site visits. So we do unannounced site visits to all of our facilities on an annual basis. When we go there, we will audit their shipments to make sure that we can track every single monkey in a shipment. Sometimes these shipments are upwards of 700 animals, so it can take us quite a bit of time. Um, we will verify that NHPs are only distributed for approved purposes of science, education, or exhibition. And then we also review staff training records. 
We look at the facility. We ask the staff, what PPE are you wearing? We ask when they were last trained. We will go into the quarantine areas where the NHPs are housed. We look for any sort of violations um, for the Animal Welfare Act in terms of how the animals are caged, whether they have appropriate water and, and feeding um, set out. So it's a, a pretty extensive um, process when we go on these site visits. It can take us a couple of days to go through a facility and do a complete inspection. At the end of that time, they're issued a report and they're given a uh, deadline by which they have to respond and address any issues of non-compliance. They fail to do so, we will not renew their registration and they will no longer be allowed to import NHPs. The third aspect of the program really has to do with monitoring the shipment when it arrives at our port of entry. So as some of our previous speakers have noted, we work very closely with USDA, Fish and Wildlife and Customs and Border Protection when these shipments arrive. Um, we will coordinate inspection. Um, we monitor the offloading process to make sure, one, that the animals um, are healthy, that we're not having any issues with, with illness or death um, on the, in the animals as they come off the flight. But we're also making sure that all of the people within a five foot radius of any NHP are in appropriate PPE, that they're masked up, that they're protected, and that they're not exposing themselves to any potential public health hazards. Um, we will also monitor the airline and the offloaders and the ground crew to make sure that everything is disinfected appropriately. And then we also make sure that the ground transportation crew is loading those NHPs, getting them off the airline quickly, not leaving them on the tarmac, getting them into the, the um, uh, temperature controlled vans and getting them on their way as quickly as possible. So I mentioned earlier that we do regulate the importation of African rodents. This is a process for these animals. Uh, it's similar to our NHP imports, but it's a little less stringent. Um, we require importers to um, apply for a permit or a permission letter in advance of bringing these animals in. They can only be imported for science, education, or exhibition. And part of that permit or permission letter process includes us talking with them and getting an extensive and detailed plan about how they're gonna transport that animal, what crate it's gonna go in, what flight it's gonna come into, the time of day and, and the port that it's arriving at. Um, and we are uh, looking at health records for the animals and making sure that the animals that are coming in uh, are healthy and that they have a solid plan in place for how they're gonna transport from the airport to the approved facility. Uh, these are some other animals that we regulate and they have very similar importation requirements to the African rodents that I just discussed. All right, so this is actually gonna be a quick, quick one slide. Um, so our role in live animal transportation, um, we really defer to USDA and the Animal Welfare Act and we work very closely with them. Um, and we adhere to their transportation standards and guidelines for the movement of live animals. Uh, we do require that any animal that we regulate be healthy on arrival. And then we do have some additional requirements for non-human primates and dogs to arrive at certain ports of entry. Um, but really we support compliance with industry transportation regulations and guidelines that have been released by USDA, uh, IATA and the Department of Transportation. Uh, we do work collaboratively, collaboratively with our federal port partners, um, and in instances of non-compliance, we will report um, to USDA or the DOT so that they can follow up accordingly. All right, so now I want to get to some case reports where we can spend some time talking about um, bad things that have happened. All right, so to start us off, I think uh, someone mentioned yesterday, we, we estimate that roughly a million dogs enter the U.S. every year. Uh, we think 700,000, about 700,000 come by air, and roughly 100,000 of those are from rabies high-risk countries. But I do want to stress that these are estimates that have been gathered from multiple data sources over a 10-year period. Um, they are estimates only. There is no federal agency that tracks dog importations, and so the true number of dogs that are imported is unknown. 
So in June of 2021, a rescue group imported 33 dogs and one cat into Chicago from Azerbaijan, including this very adorable and cute five-month-old mixed-breed dog. The CDC Chicago quarantine station staff met this flight. They visually inspected all the animals in their crates. They looked at their paperwork. They verified their paperwork was in order. Uh, everybody appeared healthy, and so they were cleared for entry. Um, the dog was driven to its um, adoptive family home in Pennsylvania, and three days after arrival, it began drooling, vocalizing abnormally, um, acting a little drunk and neurologic, uh, and was taken to a veterinarian. Uh, at the veterinary clinic, it suffered cardiac arrest, and the owner elected to euthanize the dog. Now, the vet was smart enough to submit rabies testing to the state of Pennsylvania, uh, who confirmed that the dog did in fact have rabies. Um, CDC did confirmatory testing and was able to type the variant, which means we can figure out where in the world this rabies strain came from. And it matched a rabies strain that is present in Azerbaijan and the Caucasus mountain regions. Now, rabies is a lethal disease in both dogs and people. 99 out of every 100 people that are infected with rabies will die, okay? If you are lucky enough to be that 1% that survive, you will suffer severe neurologic sequelae. You will have to learn to walk and talk again. Um, and the people that have survived have not lived very long after surviving. Um, it's an incredibly devastating disease. Luckily, there is a highly effective vaccine that we can give dogs. And that vaccine prevents infection, not only in the dog, but it prevents infection uh, from the dog infecting people and from the dog infecting other pets and wildlife. Unfortunately, in this case, 37 people had potential exposures and 18 of them underwent post-exposure prophylaxis uh, to prevent rabies, including several airport workers that been, had been involved in the offloading of the crates of these dogs when they arrived. Now the remaining rescue animals were shipped very quickly to nine other states. And this is not uncommon in the rescue world. Animals will touch down at one airport and within a day or two, they are out the door and on their way to different rescue organizations or foster homes. And that can make it really difficult to track these cases when we need to do follow-up. So in this situation, CDC partnered with nine different state health departments to uh, do essentially contact tracing. Um, and we set up to do a prospective serologic monitoring um, or PSM. PSM is a test that we can do to assess the vaccination status of the remaining dogs in the cohort. So 32 dogs were sampled, including one sample that we got from the rabid dog the morning that he died. And what we found was that nearly a quarter, so almost 25% of those dogs failed the PSM and were considered previously unvaccinated. Yet they all had what appeared to be valid rabies vaccination certificates. So all of the remaining dogs in the US were vaccinated and then they were placed in quarantines of anywhere from 45 days to six months based on the PSM results and the state laws within the state that they were residing in. It's a pretty expensive process to quarantine a, a rabid dog or a, a dog exposed to rabies for a six month period. So you can imagine the cost incurred by the state and the foster families that accepted these dogs. Now this is where it gets kind of cool. So we worked with the vaccine manufacturer to conduct a forensic investigation of the vaccine product and the labels. And what we found was that there really weren't any issues with the vaccine lot. There hadn't been any reported failures uh, with this vaccine lot in any other animals around the world. And so we pulled out those rabies vaccination certificates and we began to look at veterinary clinic information, manufacturer and lot number information that were on these rabies vaccination certificates. And we compared them to the PSM results. And what we found is that there was a high likelihood of vaccine failure if the dog on the certificate had been vaccinated by vet clinic A in Azerbaijan. And this suggested that there was a problem with how the vaccine was either handled or administered in that clinic in Azerbaijan. So we reached out, had some communication with the clinic and the rescue, and what we discovered was that they had a new veterinary intern 
who was administering half doses of rabies vaccine. So for those of you who are veterinarians, we know that is a big no-no, we don't do that. For those of you who are not veterinarians, that is a big no-no, we don't do that. <laughs> um, so one of the challenges with this is that the rabies vaccination certificate requirements that we require on, uh, on the forms that come in for these imported dogs, specifically the lot numbers, the manufacturer information, the vet clinic information, these were really crucial in helping us trace back what happened in this case. Uh, information, we would have had no idea and, and not know where to look. The problem is, is that these vaccination certificates from foreign countries do not always include this information. There is no standardized import vaccination form that is required. And this is one of the reasons that CDC has proposed in our notice of proposed rulemaking to start requiring all dogs who are coming into the country to provide this information on a standardized form. Now, I know Alan showed you a form yesterday that had rabies vaccine information on it. I wanna make sure that it's clear. That is for commercial dog imports only. So if you're bringing in your personal pet from a high-risk country and it's not coming in for commercial import, you don't have a standard required form that you have to present on arrival in the US. And that creates a lot of problems for Customs and Border Protection, CDC and USDA when we are at a port sorting through 40 pieces of paperwork. The airlines I think are equally frustrated because they get the pile of paperwork and nobody knows what to look at. So having a standardized form is really critical to be able to streamline, to know to look exactly at the form and say, yep, you've got all the information, you're good to go or to be able to say this form is incomplete, you gotta go back to your vet. So this next case occurred in October of last year. It was a 10 month old female French bulldog who was coming in from Warsaw, Poland into Chicago. Chicago is a very unlucky port. <laughs> um, on the flight, the dog aborted three stillborn puppies and the dog was in the passenger cabin and appeared to be in distress. So the airline notified CDC that this had occurred. Um, and they also told us before the flight landed that a airline um, employee had um, given mouth to snout to one of the stillborn fetuses on board the flight. So when the flight landed, our quarantine public health officers boarded the flight to assess the potential health risks and gather contact information for all the passengers that had had contact with that, those, that dog and the stillborn fetuses. Um, we gathered all their contact information and then uh, we also confirmed that disinfection of the plane occurred. Now the CDC veterinarians working on this case, uh, we were suspicious of a potential zoonotic disease such as brucellosis or leptospirosis. So we put this dog on a medical hold. We had it transferred immediately um, to a local emergency veterinary clinic. When it arrived at the clinic, it passed a fourth stillborn fetus. So she, she had a really rough day. Um, the samples were sent to a diagnostic lab and they did come back positive for Brucella canis. Now Brucella canis is a bacteria that causes the disease brucellosis. And it can be shed in the bodily fluids of dogs um, especially the birthing fluids. Um, dogs that are used for breeding, as she was intended to be used for, it is recommended that they be tested uh, routinely throughout their life if they're going to be used in a breeding program, um, because this bacteria can spread not only between dogs, but it can spread from dogs to people, it can spread from dogs to uh, livestock and also to wildlife. So this particular dog had a, a cage mate, if you will, on the flight. Um, they were purchased by breeders here in the US for $8,000. Um, so quite expensive. Um, the, the breeders told CDC that they had intended to sell these puppies for nearly $40,000. I couldn't really wrap my mind around that. That seemed a little bit excessive, but upon further questioning, what they were telling me is that the particular color pattern of this French bulldog was very rare and that if the puppies looked anything like the mom, they could get high dollar value. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's a lot of money to be making off of puppies. Um, one of the challenges with this case 
other than the mouth to snout issue, um, was that the dogs were transported by a flight parent or a flight volunteer who had no knowledge of the dog's medical history. He didn't even know she was pregnant. Completely surprised by that. Now, as I mentioned, brucellosis is a zoonotic disease. It can infect people, okay? The problem is, is it's pretty nonspecific. You get fever, you get aches and pains, you get enlarged lymph nodes. It's kind of nonspecific, so it can be really difficult to diagnose but it can have really severe outcomes, uh, heart infection, bone infection, miscarriages in humans. Um, and it's a really difficult disease to treat. Even if you get on the course of antibiotics, which you'll have to be on anywhere from three to six months, you can still get recurring infections throughout your life. Um, and that occurs in animals that are infected as well. So when we hear that flight parents or flight volunteers are taking these dogs, with zoonotic diseases and they're transporting them, it raises a huge red flag for us, right? But the use of flight parents and flight volunteers is pretty common in the rescue and the breeding world. Um, these flight parents are compensated, sometimes with money, sometimes with an airline ticket, sometimes with something else, um, to transport these dogs that they really don't know anything about. They're not registered with USDA as animal transporters. Uh, and as I mentioned, they usually don't have any knowledge of the animal's health history. Um, for example, two of the last four rabid dogs that have been imported into the United States were transported by flight parents who were bitten or scratched by those dogs on the flight and then had to undergo post-exposure prophylaxis on arrival. It can be really challenging to identify these flight parents or flight volunteers because they will usually claim the dogs are their own personal pets in order to avoid the USDA APHIS dog import permit requirements. Now, the World Organization for Animal Health, WOA, um, does recommend that pregnant livestock that are in late stage pregnancy uh, not be transported by air. Unfortunately, there are no such recommendations for dogs or cats or companion pets. Um, and the US does not have any regulations prohibiting the transportation of, of pregnant companion animals. In this case, I think the lack of disease screening prior to transport, uh, along with the movement of animals with an unknown medical history by flight parents, contribute to increased health risks uh, for the people that are involved in the transportation of this dog. Everyone from the airline staff that had contact with this dog and gave mouth to snout, to the ground crew or the cargo warehouse staff, um, to the passengers on the plane. So CDC has worked really closely with USDA and Customs and Border Protection to identify five, soon to be six, animal care facilities that um, can partner with federal agencies to help prevent the importation of public health or foreign animal diseases of concern. I mentioned these animal care facilities at the beginning of the talk, and I think this case is a really nice example of how that partnership can work. So in December of 2022, an eight-month-old spayed female Maltese dog arrived from the United Arab Emirates. She was sent to the CDC-approved animal care facility uh, where she was examined by a vet who found a tick on her right ear. Um, we were curious, so we partnered with USDA and had that tick sent to the National Veterinary Services Lab, and they identified it as a foreign tick called Ripocephalus kamikaze which I think is kind of a cool name for a tick. <laughs> um, but the really interesting thing about this is that Ripocephalus kamikaze has never been found in the United States. Moreover, it has never been seen in the Western hemisphere. So this was a foreign exotic tick that we'd never had on US soil that would have been imported and potentially spread in the community uh, had this, this tick not been found at the animal care facility. So I think these private animal care facilities that USDA, CBP, and CDC partner with really can be a huge asset to us in the future um, in terms of detecting and preventing the importation of animals with diseases uh, or foreign parasites or ticks that we're concerned about. I think we still have a long way to go. We recognize six ports is not enough. We know we need more. We are actively working on it. But I think we've made a lot of great progress in the past few years with our federal partners and with these private uh, companies to be able to address some of these challenges that we faced frequently.
So I, I mentioned I talk a little bit about uh, African rodents. Um, how many of you have heard of the Hero Rat Program? Okay, a few, super cool, all right. So for those of you who've not heard of the Hero Rat Program, there is a great TED Talk on it and there's a lot of YouTube videos and I would strongly encourage you to go and check this out. The Hero Rat Program was started by a Dutch gentleman who wanted to use uh, locally available resources to help African communities detect landmines and prevent diseases like tuberculosis within their own community. So instead of looking to working dogs raised and trained in the United States, he looked at using Gambian pouch rats, which are found throughout Africa, um, because they have incredibly sensitive noses, great, great noses, um, and they're able to detect landmines and tuberculosis. Um, it's a really cool program. It's really fun to watch them like run on their little leashes and, and search the land area. Um, and when they find the mines, they dig. I always get nervous because I think, what if you dig too far? But so far, I don't think anything bad has happened. But um, when they either retire or when they fail out of training, um, so maybe they don't make the final certification for finding landmines, um, this program partners with U.S. zoos. Uh, to bring these uh, African rodents over and continue the education work here in the U.S. to spread the word about this program. And so CDC works with U.S. zoos as well as the Hero Rats program um, to basically help them with the paperwork and the shipping process to make sure it's a smooth flight and transition to get them from Tanzania into the U.S. and to the zoos that they are uh, destined to head to. So it's a pretty cool program. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about non-human primates. So um, this graph charts the number of non-human primate imports into the United States from 2000 to 2022. So you can see the past few years, roughly 30,000 primates uh, come into the US every year. The majority of those are used for uh, biomedical research purposes, but we do also partner with zoos who are bringing in non-human primates as well. So this map shows our 2022 data by country uh, with the percent change from 2021. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about that. What I wanted to show you is basically uh, where these NHP are being sourced from. So the NHP coming into the United States are mainly coming from Southeast Asia, the Caribbean and Africa. So Gwen had uh, also talked about this case a little bit earlier. Um, in January of 2022, uh, one of the vehicles transporting NHP from JFK Airport on its way to the CDC quarantine facility collided with a garbage truck um, on a roadway in Pennsylvania. I'm sure some of you may have seen this in the news. Um, three of the non-human primates that were on the vehicle did escape, um, and CDC coordinated with state and local public health uh, wildlife and emergency management officials during the accident investigation and the response. Now, all the NHP were accounted for within 12 hours of the crash, um, but I think this case really demonstrates uh, how important it is to have a contingency plan when you are moving animals by air or by ground. Um, I think another point I want to hammer home uh, is what was talked about yesterday is it's not only having a contingency plan, but it's having a backup to your contingency plan. Unfortunately, in this accident, the transporters who were moving the NHP, the gentlemen who are trained to don and doff PPE, to feed and water these animals, to check their health status, to move their crates, both had to be taken by ambulance to the emergency room. So that left us with zero people on the ground who had working knowledge of what to do with these animals. It was a pretty scary situation to be in. And so I just want to encourage you guys, you know, as you are engaging in animal transport, definitely consider vehicle accidents in your contingency plan uh, and have a backup in case, heaven forbid, the staff are injured, have to go to the hospital and you've got to get additional people on site. Um, I love the idea of a phone tree. I kind of thought about it a little bit differently because in this situation, these primates were traveling from New York to another state. And let's say they're leaving your facility in New York. If you get a call that there's been an accident, you wanna get out there as quickly as possible, 
maybe you can respond in an hour, maybe two, but if we're talking, you know, they're traveling three or four states over, it may take you more than eight to 12 hours to get out to them and that's not feasible. So one thing to consider is as you're mapping your road, your road route, if you're driving across multiple states, what other partner zoos or organizations could you reach out to along that roadway map in case of an accident, right? If you're traveling through Texas, do you have a chain of partners that you could say, oh my gosh, we just had an accident near Dallas. Can anybody from the Dallas Zoo come out and assist? Um, I think that's really critical. Uh, and, and I think that was a lesson that we, we learned in this situation. Um, to follow on Bonnie's talk, I did wanna talk a little bit about the issues that we're having with smuggled monkeys at the US-Mexico border. I do think this is a really nice example that demonstrates the partnership between Customs and Border Protection, Border Patrol, Fish and Wildlife, USDA, and CDC. So CDC will assist Fish and Wildlife when these uh, smuggled or trafficked animals are brought across the border. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all NHP that come into the country need to go into a CDC approved quarantine, and that includes smuggled and trafficked NHP. Um, we do require they do a minimum of a 30, 31 day quarantine on arrival. Um, and so we will work with Fish and Wildlife to identify CDC approved quarantine facilities. Um, and there's been one or two situations where we've, we've helped with the transport of those animals um, to get them to those facilities quickly. So in some situations, our CDC registered importers may not have space available or they may be several states away. Um, and so in those situations, CDC will work with um, local facilities that Fish and Wildlife has approved to take on these animals. Um, we will provide worker safety guidance um, to make sure that the staff that are interacting with these NHP at the facility during their quarantine are doing so in as safe a manner as possible. Uh, these are uh, two of the three smuggled monkeys that we dealt with in 2022. Um, you can see the photo on the top right was when it was seized at the port. The photo in the bottom left, this is Hans is his name, and he's uh, very happily hanging out in his new facility. <laughs> um, is there a way to play this video? It's a short loop, sorry, it may not work. Uh, this was a recent case just a couple weeks ago. Um, these uh, NHP is a backpack. You can see the holes cut into it here for ventilation. Um, this backpack contains seven juvenile spider monkeys uh, and it was confiscated by Border Patrol. Oh, now it works. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So this is the largest shipment of smuggled or trafficked spider monkeys that we've seen uh, in, in the past five years. Um, these guys were found near Brownsville, Texas. Um, and one of the problems we had right away was the heat. Uh, we did not have an indoor facility at the port to house these animals at. Um, and so you can see it was quite warm in Brownsville. Um, and so Fish and Wildlife, USDA and CDC really you know, jumped into action to find safe housing options for these animals. Um, unfortunately, the nearest CDC approved quarantine facility that could take this animal was in Oklahoma. It was way too long of a drive. Um, and there are cost considerations. Our registered importers um, are private businesses. And so they can sometimes charge Fish and Wildlife or CDC to house these animals. Now they do it at cost. They're not making a profit off of it, but it presents a challenge if we don't have a budget for that. Um, and so one of the things that I think was great about this case is that Fish and Wildlife really, uh, really did an outstanding job of reaching out to uh, Mexican government authorities to work to return these animals back to Mexico um, to Profepa, which is the equivalent of Fish and Wildlife in Mexico. Um, so they were able to get them back over into Mexico, uh, into zoos and sanctuaries to be rehabilitated. This is the first time we've ever had this happen. And, the last five years I've been with the program. Um, and I just think it shows some of the, the innovation and creative thinking of, of what happens when we get put in these stressful situations of having to find an immediate uh, facility and, and, and resolution for uh, the animals that are smuggled in. Um, and the cool thing about this, or 
it's not cool that they're smuggled, but um, that relationship that Fish and Wildlife built came in handy because the very next day we had another smuggled monkey and Fish and Wildlife was able to go back, call that same person, get them back out to the border, come pick up the monkey. So I think we're starting to establish a, a pattern of how we want to, to have a relationship with Mexican authorities in dealing with these animals. One of the challenges though, is that sometimes Fish and Wildlife uh, and HSI will find these animals not at the border, but after they're already here in the US, when they're in Houston or in Dallas already. And in those situations, it can be really difficult to return an animal to a country because you can't actually prove it came from that country. Um, and so in those situations, we do have to find long-term care and housing for these animals here in the United States. So one of the things that um, all the government partners involved in this have done is started to coordinate with AZA and with the Species Survival Program. Um, and I think we've started to build some really good collaborations and networks. Um, and we really look forward to continuing to work with the zoo community um, in how to deal with these smuggled animals because it, it is, uh, it's really unfortunate, um, but we do need to find safe housing for them. So in summary, uh, you know, I think the transportation of live animals can mirror uh, human international travel patterns, and that creates possibilities for disease transmission um, between people, pets, wildlife, and livestock. Um, protecting wildlife and domestic pets, both before, during, and after transit, uh, as well as the people who have contact with those animals during that time is really important. I think there are a lot of challenges that we face in the federal government when these sick animals um, or these traffic or smuggled animals arrive in the United States. Um, but I think these challenges also present us with an opportunity to coordinate across federal agencies, uh, the transportation industry and law enforcement partners to get creative with our solutions um, and to be able to care for these animals. I do have a couple people to thank. Um, there were a lot of partners involved um, in the cases that I talked about today. So I do just wanna acknowledge them really quickly. Um, I can't do my job without them. So I really appreciate their assistance. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so if we have questions internally, please raise your hand. And if there are questions uh, virtually, please put them in the Q&A. All right, first question will be right here. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask. I'm like, what are you going to hit me with? Oh, okay, Just go no, for it. No. I, well, are there any financial or penalty repercussions for the rescue groups that are that are repeated offenders? It's a great Charges question. Brought? Yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately, CDC is not a law enforcement agency. Um, and what that means is that our ability to cite fine or penalize people uh, does not exist. It's extremely challenging. And for us to get that authority, we actually have to go back to Congress and Congress has to basically rewrite the statute. Um, and that's a, a big lift. So I think that's one of the things that is really challenging right now in trying to address some of the dog importation challenges. Um, I also think it's one of the reasons it's really important for us to continue to collaborate with USDA uh, and Customs and Border Protection in these situations because oftentimes CDC owns, you know, I say owns, regulates a very small portion of that import, but there might be a USDA violation or a CBP violation. And so if we're communicating these challenges and these problems as they're occurring, other agencies can step in and, and hopefully offer some assistance while we are uh, a little bit limited in terms of the, the uh, penalties we can issue. Okay, Karen, do we have a virtual question? Can you go more into the considerations of the 31 day quarantine or the approach to TB screening for animals that are being quarantined? I wish I could ask a fault question and say, could you clarify? <laughs> Sorry, I know this is online. Um, the 31 day quarantine, what we do is we do require uh, three tuberculosis tests, uh, 14 days apart, excuse me, yep, every two weeks. Um, and so over the course of that 31 day period, NHPs are tested for tuberculosis at least three times. And then if there are any other 
uh, signs of illness that develop, such as diarrhea, um, then they will undergo additional diagnostic testing as well to determine the cause of illness. Okay, Chad, I think you had a question over there. I thank you. Great presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the CDC rabies and microchip record form that the CDC published, which we love us exporters that are doing a lot of dogs that we have a lot of clients who travel somewhere to a high risk rabies country and then return. And so that form has been amazing. Um, currently it's only listed as highly recommended. Are there any plans to make that required? Um, that would be amazing. One of our biggest struggles working with our US veterinarians is the non-consistency of rabies records from clinic to clinic, state to state, um, you know, listing a rabies as a killed rabies vaccine. That's not the name. There's no manufacturer, yeah. there's no, you know, like, so we are constantly having to go back to our US veterinarians and go, no, we need the name, we need the manufacturer, we need the lot, we need the expiries. So it's really inconsistent record keeping. And a lot of that is because not, it's not the US vet's fault. It's a lot of it's because of the software that they have to deal with in their clinics and what they're allowed to put in. So can we make the CDC rabies vaccination microchip record like the law of the land for the entire US? I mean, great. just a wish list item. I was great just question. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah. So in our notice of proposed rulemaking, we are proposing to have a required form. Now, we're gonna deal with US dogs a little bit different in the proposal. Um, what we have done is we have partnered with USDA Veterinary Services, and we are looking to use the VHIC system. If you guys know about VHICS, it's the system that all your USDA accredited vets already use. So they're gonna be able to get that form, hopefully knock on wood, if everything goes smoothly. Um, they're gonna be able to get that form through that uh, system. And so I think it's a, a really nice way that we're kind of combining requirements um, and hopefully minimizing the stress on those USDA accredited vets as they're doing the health search. So that's how we're going to handle the US vaccinated dogs. Our foreign vaccinated dogs, it's going to be a standardized form. Uh, there's a little bit of additional information that we are proposing to require. Um, the main thing that uh, we would like to consider adding is a requirement for uh, an official veterinarian in the exporting country to certify that paperwork. So similar to how our USDA accredited veterinarians certify paperwork, we want exporting governments to do that as well. And there's already a system set up to do that. They do it for other animals. A lot of them already do it for dogs. So it's not a huge burden or a huge lift to, to put this in there, but it will standardize things across the board. Okay, Karen, I think you had another virtual question. So I have a follow-up question on the um, testing. Can you elaborate on the TB testing for quarantine for non-human primates? Is it intramural, uh, in, interdermal testing or a blood serology testing? It, it is an, an intradermal test that is done. And we have one other one. Um, what are the requirements for an animal that dies in transit? Are you... Uh, are they talking specifically about an NHP or a dog? It or? doesn't say specifically. Okay. <laughs> so I'll just take a stab at this. All right. So if a dog dies in transit um, on arrival, um, Customs and Border Protection or the airline will contact our quarantine station. Our quarantine station gets a hold of our staff veterinarians and we do a public health risk assessment. So we're gonna look at vaccination status of the dog, health status, age, where it was coming from. And then we're gonna look at whether or not it has bitten or scratched anybody in the 10 days before travel. It's really critical for determining potential rabies exposures. And based on that information, we will determine whether or not we're gonna order a necropsy with rabies testing, just a necropsy, some other sort of testing, um, and so we really do handle it on a case-by-case -case basis, um, dependent on the health status of that animal. Um, for an NHP that dies uh, in transit, it is an automatic necropsy with histopathology, diagnostic testing. We need to know the cause of death of that animal before we release any animals from that quarantine cohort. So not only will we need testing on that animal, but nobody else in the cohort is going anywhere until we know what the cause of death was for that NHP. Okay, we have one more question right here. How often is the CDC high-risk countries updated um, with screwworm or with in regards to rabies? 
So our rabies country list is updated every year. Um, every January and February, our rabies subject matter experts um, convene a panel uh, and they look at data that has been published and presented to the World Health Organization, to the World Organization for Animal Health, um, rabies epi bulletin. They do a pretty extensive literature search um, to look for any sort of publications, documentation, reporting um, that would suggest a country has uh, been able to implement and maintain uh, the elimination of, of canine rabies virus variant. Um, so it's done on a yearly basis. In terms of your question about, I think it was African swine fever, that's actually a USDA veterinary services requirement. So I'd have to defer to them to answer the question of how often they update that country list. I, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, Karen, did we have any other questions? Yes, coming off a pandemic caused by a virus that allegedly stemmed in animals, what are the gaps in animal disease surveillance and how should it they be filled with regards to the importation of animals especially? That is a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, that's a tough one to answer. So I, I think this is a discussion that is occurring um, within fish and wildlife right now, within USDA, within CBP, I think across the board, we're looking at um, disease surveillance and detection. And, and, and what I'll say is that um, there are a lot of animals that come in uh, that we don't have any surveillance for. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very honest. We don't have the capacity, we don't have the staffing. Um, and one of the challenges when you're talking about emerging diseases is how do you detect something when you don't know what you're looking for and you don't have a test to determine whether an animal has it or not? Those are two of our biggest challenges when we look at, um, you know, when, and when we talk about starting to do surveillance on wildlife or on companion animals or on livestock, um, there has to be a test and we have to know what we're looking for. Um, and so I think that presents some unique challenges um, that we have to continue to have discussions about um, with subject matter experts, with university partners um, to try and map out a plan moving forward. Okay, if you guys could put your hands together for Dr. Emily Parachi.